Hey guys, welcome to the Funky Marketing Show, another episode when I get to speak to people that I see on LinkedIn or uh, on Twitter that are, you know, uh, somebody who has great point of view, has experience in the industry uh, and does something that we consider as funky marketing a bit differently. So today my guest is uh, Yil Sigal and we're going to talk about all kinds of different stuff. So from buyer journey, differentiation, positioning, uh, the role of the content today and end up with talking about paid media. So before we get into that, before he is joins me uh, here, let's uh, let's play the funky intro. Welcome to the Funky Marketing Show, man. How you going? Yeah, uh, doing like this. This intro always gets me in the mood to kind of go deep on some topics and just like do something fresh. Yeah, it's very it's, uh, energetic. it's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a good one, and I don't change it because it's got me in a certain mood, and I'm like, let's keep it up. Let's do it. Uh, so, uh, before we get into all these topics, uh, maybe you can just share a thing or two about you, uh, for the people that don't know who you are, don't, aren't connected with you on LinkedIn or, you know, just never got in touch with you. Yeah. Well, obviously if you haven't connected with me on LinkedIn, definitely go and do that. Um, uh, that goes without saying, um, First of all, my name is Yis Siegel. I'm currently, I run uh, demand generation at a, te at a tele uh, telecommunications company um, called Flow Live. Um, I also consult as a fractional CMO and mentor a lot of different startups in early stages. Um, and I've basically spent a lot of my time with early or smaller companies, helping them uh, come up with different strategies to help them essentially compete with bigger companies, even if they have uh, fewer resources. Yeah, I love that. That sounds good because you usually what I what I the thing that is becoming now more like common thing that I'm seeing, especially working with uh, with a lot of tech dev companies from from this area, is that they try to behave like the big ones because that's where they want to go. And instead of using the advantage of being small and the ability to move fast to change things to try things out, they try they have this David and Goliath syndrome when they try to behave yeah. like Goliath. You know, it's not the same if you have like thousand people and he, and uh, your competitor has hundred thousand. It's completely different yeah. game. Very different momentum. You can never really. You know. Also, even when you get to let's say at any stage, you don't know what the companies did beforehand and what the market, the, the actual industry in the market itself, like what it was kind like its composition. For example, if you want to compete, let's say against like IBM, for example. They've been around for a good amount of years, but even let's say they're competing now, you don't know their market size, you don't know how they formulated and got the relationship that they got earlier on. So even though they may, or even if you take a cybersecurity company, right? Take any cybersecurity company. So that has been around for a good six, seven years. Cybersecurity was very different six, seven years ago. The market composition was very di different and you don't know who they've net networked with. They don't know, you don't know what kind of people they've had um, that could be able to do certain things. Sometimes it's on the person. Uh, a lot of factors go into getting to a company to hyper growth and to build that momentum. And each journey is essentially unique. It's it's not a great idea to copy somebody else's strategy. Agree, because something that, that may have been uh, good for the company of your size like 10 years ago that your competitors has done before may be completely new. And one of the things that in that are impacting that is the buyer's journey, right? Like if yeah. we go if we go back and look at like two, three years ago, just before the COVID, it was completely different from what we have now. And I always like to go back to the things like 
how B2B companies were actually, you know, uh, finding momentum, going with intent. We didn't have this pre-intent moment. Everybody were going to the Google. We go to Google, we search, we find who we're going to hire. Then we, you know, compare companies, look at the reviews, testimonials, and go into that. Now we have social, now we have communities, now we have different things, and all that is impacting the buyer journey. So tell me, how do you see it? Well, for, uh, there's a few different, uh, the buyer's journey, I think one of the older models of the buyer's journey is very static. They essentially just included the stages, like, you, you know, the one that's proposed by HubSpot, the awareness consideration decision. That only takes a, a very small part of the actual buyer's journey, and that is like when mm-hmm. you're on, on mode. This, what kind of what COVID, COVID and especially those who have experimented with social media a lot more, I've realized, and what I've also seen throughout the, re- when I've been researching and, and interviewing a lot of these different people is that it's far more nuanced than, um, than just those stages. And often you choose somebody just because you have a good connection with them or it was referred. And this is where, you know, we've been talking about that dormant stage, that pre-aware, pre-problem where before there's any sort of notion to solve any sort of problem, even if you're aware of the problem, but you don't care to solve it now, you're still at this like dormant stage. And getting getting good experiences at that stage is far more important uh, than, than we ever thought. Because one of the things that COVID did that didn't, that really, uh, I think, transformed the industry is that we all these things were all there. We just became more reliant upon social yeah. for activity. And so not, it's actually, it's kind of not that reliance has made it easier because now you can connect with people in a way that you couldn't connect with them before, which makes it easier to become a consideration when they leave that dormant stage. But it also means that they're more willing to consider you because of social media than they were before. And before and it was more traditional, you know, inside, they were reliant upon, you know, uh, uh, a lot of the executives that I talked, especially uh, CEOs, they were, you know, their advisors, people within their executive network, those are the people that they relied upon for counsel. Now, they're, they're essentially their network's expanded. You can reach them a lot easier if you can do it properly and you make it less about sales and about creating mutually beneficial, my, positive micro experiences. And that's really at, at the beginning. But the buyer's journey is different for all it. One of the deficits of like the old model is that it's one size fit all. And I found that it's like, first of all, first time founders are very different to second time founders. Agencies, if I wanted to sell to you, it would be very different to if I wanted to sell to, to a corporation, right? Because me selling to you, as I have to consider what you would propose to your clients. And so I've mm-hmm. never won, I have not, I've never truly won the deal until you can get a proof of concept in front of your own clients and get a sign. So even if you believe that my service would be helpful to you, you wouldn't be able to, and it would be really good. You wouldn't pen something in until your client signs it. So you have, it's a little bit more of like a referral recommendation kind of contract. And the risk for you, because you're recommending me, is a lot higher. And so the strategy that I would then take would be very different. Yeah, I mean, uh, some biases that were in B2B for a long time, they're, they're, are still there. Even though if we consider them or no, like if you have to choose uh, a vendor for somebody, you know, if you are, for example, a CMO, in a lot of enterprise level companies, they still choose, you know, I'm going to choose the best one that, you know, I'm going to do a research, see what everybody says and hire the best one based on that, not based on any personal relationships, because if they fail, I can always say I hired the best, the best one yet. Go ahead, do a research, right. And uh, then if you use tool, it goes a certain way because like somebody who is going after buying the tool, uh, they, they go after, you know, after, uh, the thing that will make them not lose the job, right? Something that yeah. is already proved. And there are some others who are doing completely different things. Maybe somebody who is, uh, you know, on a different position in a different, uh, even a company of a different level, 
that goes and connect with, connects with people and then it leads uh, to a decision making by some other things on his mind. Like this is the guy that I know I'm following here for like five years. Now is the time for us to change uh, what we use for that. And he's the first th thing on my mind. I'm going to ask him first. Then I'm going to see what's out there if that doesn't work. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, I, first of all, that first point, um, I think is definitely something that needs to be talked about more. It's essentially the path of least resistance and risk management. And you have like the concept of like dealing with objections, but there are a lot of objections that are sort of either subconscious or they're subconscious, they're social or they're based around risk like and fears based around how they will be perceived if the experiment with this new technology or service fails um, and the impact it will have. Sometimes it's easy to get rid of a company, but if you have a company that's very embedded, a service very embedded, or if they make a colossal mistake, then it's a huge, it's kind of a huge risk and you take the path of least resistance essentially because um, because you want to make sure that if something goes wrong, you're set up. You're saying, I did my due, my due diligence. And often that comes with the biggest brands, people with the best brand reputation. Um, people are talking about them. It, uh, they've proven track record. And it's just a very easy way to do that. And, and in a way, a lot of the time where content goes wrong is that it doesn't actually deal with the emotional element that goes into researching and creating affinity and then deciding on, am I going to take this? Because it doesn't deal with the risk that's associated with it. And then on the second point is, is, is the same concept, is that if somebody's referred me to you, or if I have a, let's say I was planning on using funky marketing for something, right? So, and, and that's because I've, we've, we've been engaged with each other for a, for a year or two years, whatever it is. That's because I have a personal relationship with you. And I know that if I use you, you'll do right. You know what you're talking about. Um, you, you seem to have, like, let's say you, you speak in a way that that's alongside the way that I would want a marketing agency to, to work, obviously uh, a little bit of promotion for you there, but, um, but essentially, and, and there's obviously some proven track record, but the personal relationship is also something that's very underrated. In fact, I think it was about uh, two years ago, um, I was researching um, a company to use for uh, uh, business intelligence. And, for, and uh, I think the deal would have been something close to like $40,000 a year deal, right? It was the best platform that we could have recommended for the client for what they needed. But I got on a call with the CEO and he had members of his executive team and he completely ridiculed his chief of operations on the call. He says, that's his opinion, but there's X, Y, and Z. And from that, I said, I can't recommend you. It's like, I didn't have, if that's the company that's there, I killed the deal. And I had to explain to the person that I'm going to go with another company. I researched a completely new company, which I thought was a much, at the end was a much better um, option for them. But I hadn't considered them. Um, because I didn't consider that point. I only consider them because of the bad relationship that, or the bad perception this, the CEO had. And it was something so small. And the same goes for something big, uh, for positive. If I have positive in you, I'm more likely to think about you, uh, to choose you because I already like you. And, I tr and that comes with trust. And if I trust you, that's also based on risk. Because I, if I can trust you, it means that I'm going to trust that you're not going to mess me over either. Yeah, I love that example. Thanks for sharing. It reminded me of, of a thing like I was approached by a startup, a well-known startup in the in the community to kind of help them with demand, especially with uh, with advertising part. And like there were two guys on the call. Uh, like I know the guy who is not the main guy and the main guy ridiculed the other guy. Yeah. And I was like, and then, like, after everything that was following up and the questions and those kind of things, like, they, they only ask for the um, um, case studies and testimonials from the companies within the same niche, within the same country. And I said, fuck it, I'm not going to do it. 
it all led to me thinking that I'm that I will need to prove everything that I bring in you when we work with them. So I said, okay, it's a red flag. I still consider you a good guy, but it's a no for me. So yeah, it, this is also it. like even if you're doing a SaaS company, I'm sure you, uh, I'm sure you you feel the same. You know, you've had the same experiences that. The value, like obviously there's a technology and the technology has to work. That's basic, basic expectation. In fact, it has to do a lot more than just work um, in order to really drive it. It can't just function. Um, but the underestimate, there's a big underestimation of just the personal relationships that you have with somebody in the company that's a decision maker or the support team or even the salesperson. Um, and... I, it, it really, obviously, it's, uh, if you have a good relationship, there's a build of trust and you trust the company as an extension by association. Um, and also, you just have a positive perception of it. It's, again, it's a branding moment. Those, in, those interactions create positive perceptions. And not only do they help me decide if I want to continue with them or help you want to decide if you want to actually buy them, but it also helps you decide if you want to re recommend them to somebody else. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but tell me, when we know that and we know that the buyer journey has uh, become more complicated, not linear at all, and uh, how do we uh, adjust our messaging and uh, how do we differentiate based on what we already know? If we if we have in mind that we know the way our, our buyers are going and it's it's completely mess out of which we need to come up as the number one on top of mind for for a company that uh, is looking for our product or the service yeah sure well first of all um, about the non-linear element i actually don't think that's true or it's true mm -hmm. if you look at it if you look at it from the old way the old way is awareness consideration decision those that part of the of the buyer's journey is a is in one part of the total journey that they go about, and that is when they're in that sort of active mode. But again, there's the dormant mode that they're in. There's the kind of that stage, the triggering stage that goes from dormant into uh, consideration. Then you also have the post decision modes as well. So what isn't linear is when they're in the middle of considering options. But every journey starts with the dormant stage where then they have no either they ha, either they're aware of the problem but they don't they don't actually think that they need to solve it to then there's a status quo change which means that now they have to solve it those those two you can't have those two you can't really have those two um you very rarely will you have it that they have like an actual decision and or go towards an actual problem or to a solution without actually recognizing there's a problem it is possible to kind of do both at the same time, promote a product and um, and sort of get them towards uh, uh, promote your product while you're actually um, doing problem recognition. That's what I believe real demand generation is about. It's about emphasizing the fact that they need to solve this particular problem. And uh, so you kind of straddle that. And then you have the consideration stages, which is, that's where it's not linear. Just because somebody asks for price, or wants a case study or a testimonial, it doesn't have any indication of where they are in their research process. A lot of times it depends on who's, on who's actually researching. So what I would say is this, the buyer's journey is not necessarily about messaging. Some of it is, it's about how you approach. The dormant state, right, is all about creating experiences with your target audience so that are positive. The more positive experiences that you have with them and you create this sort of sense of affinity, that's, that is where, when they have, when you, they get to that stage of problem recognition, you will be one of those considerations. And they don't have endless amount of considerations. Usually it's between three to five. They usually whittle it down to three, right? So you really need mm -hmm. to compete to be on there. The best way is to have micro those either have people refer you or have uh, or be there beforehand and have these uh, in the dormant state. And if you look at, I mean, you don't really have to look that far to see this in action. I mean, if you look at, um, let's say, use Chris Walker as an example, right? What has he done? 
he's basically created a message around a passion. He speaks passionately um, around people that may or may not actually think things need to be changed at the moment, but he speaks passionately. That creates uh, an affinity towards people kind of get emotionally connected. And if they want to change things, they get associated with him because of that imprint he's made. That's essentially what he's done. He's centered around a specific message that he keeps going in uh, day in and day out, so he becomes associated. But most of it is that he speaks passionately about it, so he gets remembered. So in that sense, it's all about creating experiences. So things like podcasts, creating enjoyable content, engaging. Social makes it so much easier to do these things than it's ever been done before. And it's also a lot easier to approach, uh, especially if you have a podcast, any of these things or co-marketing opportunities, because if it, it's a software, it's a much, if they don't think you're trying to sell something to them, they're more willing to create a co-marketing opportunity. And you've built a, a pos- an actual relationship with your target audience. So that's what you would do at the first, right? The dormant state is, the, that status quo change is really depends on what it is. On what happens, and that's kind of where, where, um, where it kinds of you need research because not all things that not all problems. What I found is that not all problems are equal. But let's say I'll give you an example. Right now, we're looking at an outreach tool to use for to sort of centralize our outbound activities. Right now, even though that's the reason why we're doing it, but now that I have that problem that I want to solve. There's a whole collection of other secondary elements that if my tool doesn't have these things, I'm not going to consider it, right? So if I go after those things, if somebody came up to me and goes after those things, it's nice, but it's not the core reason why I'm actually solving the problem. That's where jobs to be done. I have to focus around what is the core trigger that gets them over that edge, and then what are those secondary elements that get bundled within And so that would essentially be the message at that stage um, to try and really get down to what is the main reason why that trigger happened. And then, and 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 when we go into the into the research over there, a lot of things we will discover are not something that we can change, you know. But we need to aware that they are happening and resonate with our messaging around it. For example, like they had a contract with a company for like five years. Now it's time that they change it. Or a new person came into the company, they want to use that other tool, they are looking for a new tool. Or whatever it is, but with our messaging, we need to know exactly what's happening and communicate towards that uh, right. towards that call. And then obviously you have the consideration stages, which is about understanding, starting off, and first of all, um, Everything has to be, tra- you have to give it simple. Do- simple doesn't mean dumbing it down. It means making it yeah. easy to consume, right? So that's, it has to be- that's, I think, something something that uh, I, I was thinking a lot in the last two weeks, especially seeing some people on, on LinkedIn, like dumbing in doubt, or even like when they tried to simplify it, they just dump it down and yeah. uh, make it look like it's not readable. For example, create the post like a song talking about things like I cannot get out of the post to figure out what are you talking about, yeah. you know, and it's happening. It's happening a lot. I see it a lot, especially now, like when the like fantasy novels are becoming serious and movies and a lot yeah. more people are got to touch into the fantasy movies and they, they use these expressions. An example nobody knows about. You know, and it's not related to anything that's related to, for example, B2B SaaS or those kind of things. So uh, uh, I think we need to even communicate more. What does it mean making it uh, more simple instead of dumping it down? Well, yeah. Well, dumbing it down means like essentially kind of the words that you use that are understandable by everybody the grammar, short sentences, short paragraphs, some of it, some of those stuff is good, you know, not having like academic level articles generally, uh, like as like your sales message is definitely something uh, is good practice. But if you're targeting engineers or people in operations or, or even people of any sort of sophistication, 
to dumb it down to a five-year-old is, is essentially insulting, right? But also you miss out on the details that they care about. So you don't speak about, you don't have to like hone in on the features and go into everything. What, I, what I've seen work the best, and you tell me what your experience is, is that if you create, and I think this works especially well if you based around the jobs to be done framework, is if you write it in a transformative way that you essentially bundle in everything that needs to be bundled in a way that not shows benefit, but shows how it uh, transforms the person from a state from having a problem um, and to having a problem solved and in the way that it's supposed to solve it, but not just that it solves that particular problem, but also adds value to that state. So it has to be easy to use or whatever secondary elements come into the equation, but without limiting the details. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I was, I was uh, laughing at one moment because like even now the, the AI writing tools has the option to dumb me down to a five-year-old. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, actually, that, that option exists and you can actually do it. But still, it's not that simple. If you Even mm -hmm. if you use the option and the outcome is what needs to be the outcome, it just simplifies it. It doesn't dumb it down. Even that option... It doesn't dumb it down. It just simplifies things so somebody can understand. It. Yeah. yeah. I honestly blame SEO for that, by the way. I think that there's the whole flesh reading test or any of those are all about like making it. They like have different scales of what grade you're supposed to be able to read it on. They score the, they score, they give you positive scores the more like it's fit for younger people and it's it's not it's not reflective of reality agreed agreed but you know um it's kind of interesting talking about seo and value of content so let's get into into those things i think yeah. it's it's kind of interesting one i was talking about content with erin balsa uh a few months ago uh and one thing that uh stood out for me out of that conversation is like there isn't enough of a big content, meaning uh, research, meaning the content that really moves you with the right narrative and written really to change your mind from the beginning to the end. Or even like uh, if we consider content the events, there's not a huge amount of the right events that are really like, aha, this is one time, once in a lifetime experience. Uh, so, uh, and I, I agree with her. I think there's a gap over there for that type of content, but let's go and overall talk about, uh, how do you see content today? Uh, and how is it changed from what it was like a year or two before and how we used content? Do we use it differently? Um, well, content by large for the last couple of, for at least the last five to 10 years has been run by a formula. And, mm -hmm. and that's why you have so many, even events, regardless of what it is, it's a, there's essentially a, a winning, uh, supposedly, uh, supposedly winning formula um, for all the different contents. And that's almost been like the content Bible for the last 10 years. Do um, you think it's, it still stands? Are people still doing it or we moved past that stage? I honestly, I don't, I don't know because you would think, I think there's a certain point where some of the people are some of the people I think there's like three different camps here. There's mm -hmm. some of the people think that it needs to be changed but aren't moving to change it. They either don't have the position or don't have the ability or the willpower to fight what the status quo and so it ends up being the same. There are those that they just keep on they they still believe in the formula. It achieves what they want to achieve. It's a, either they don't believe in content for content, or so they just see it as something they need to do. And then you have those that um, that really have they not changed their mind. I would say that some people change their minds. I think a lot of people have never really believed in the old way of doing content. They just starting to be able to stand up for a better way of doing things. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people were just doing it because they were told to do so, right? Yeah, yeah mostly. But it's also, they were told that, 
Um, they were, it was basically a promise that was made, right? There was a promise made that if you do content, uh, if you write content, and you bring traffic to your website, you will grow your business. That if you follow this formula and that, and essentially we're talking, and this goes back to the buyer's journey. If you limit your content to that consideration, the considering option stage, awareness, uh, awareness consideration decisions, if you, that's a very limited element. And all your, and a lot of it is based around like, you know, appealing to the logical side of people, even though a lot, even in B2B decisions, we really underestimate the value of the perceptual side and the intuitive side of when we when we actually want to make decisions and then we rationalize them afterwards. But if you're just talking to the cognitive side of, of your target audience, well, you're not going to be memorable. All you're doing is producing content, especially if you aren't using subject matter experts who can really provide depth uh, into what's going on, then your content will be what it is, right? And but it's, it, but if you're focused in that area, then you'll always remain in that area. What I think, especially with this new, the adjust, the, the um, growth of social and business has allowed us to expand into using different areas. Podcasts have gone up a lot more, um, the social media, videos, networking, these kind of events, live events. All of these have grown over the last few years. And all of these are considered content that makes far greater impact at the earliest stages. And even if it's informative, it still creates far greater level of content because it's not a webinar or because it doesn't, it's just informative or it's with, because they come because they like you or because they like me, it has far more impact than the old style of content. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I'm looking back to 2020 when I got into the B2B space. I think it's changed now a little bit, but at that time, like uh, a lot of companies had content written for the SEO. So it's on the website. A lot of it was talking about themselves, about their feature, but there was some really nice article, but written for the SEO. So all structured well, you know, without, but without like point of view, with the, there were not thought leadership articles, but yes. just the articles that were covering the existing demand. And uh, what I uh, found as a good way to use them at the time, and I think that's where the content started to change and becoming what it is today. I now said what I think uh, it is today. Like we were just uh, reusing that content, adding a point of view by having interviews with the people, subject matter experts from the company, and then basically transforming it into the com content that is consumable inside the social media feed or on some other platforms, like in the video format, in audio format. But the content already existed. There, it was already there. And it was uh, getting the traffic from the Google search engine that didn't convert because they were going after the seizure makers and the content was not made for those people. It was much more basic, not uh, thought provoking and those kind of stuff. So what I think, uh, looking at that, and where we are right now, after like two and a half, three years, I think the content has become a tool that we are using to communicate our message to exactly the right people that needs to hear that message. And it's basically you need somebody to use the tool to help you use it the right way to get the right results. Right. I mean, that's exactly it. Uh, I found very similar things. Content is a tool. It's a tool to get something, a way of distributing a message um, about something, usually from uh, from one brand to an audience. But I think in the, in your story, I think the key shift that uh, with what you mentioned is that you went from, and where you sort of said where you started to see results is that you focused on the engagement element of content. That content, the, the, regardless of where it is, content is made to do two things to be engaged with and to make an impact if it's not doing any of those two things it has not achieved its mark at all right you're just producing content to just produce content it has to do both of those things to really be worth the investment 
Then, if you're talking about the different stages, there are three, I would say, second, depending on the stages that content is supposed to do. And we're not talking about written content. We're talking about any form of content, right? Yeah. The first thing is it's supposed to, as the main goal, is just to make an impact, create positive experiences. The second thing is when it's in your consideration stages, it's there to deal with risk. Essentially, all it is is to deal with, deal with risk, which means um, showing them how how it can solve their problem in a transformative way, understanding uh, understanding what they really care about, and then showing uh, showing how it's meant to be done, what are they supposed to look at. It's supposed to take care of their fears. And mm-hmm. that means, could be in depth, it may mean making, uh, may means creating content that is a bit more in depth about either if it, about like the concept guide, stuff like that. It's just to make it easier to make a decision. And the second thing of content is for the customers. It's to add value to the service, not just product announcements. It's to add value uh, to the service that they're getting from you, sort of e- e- different ways of doing the same thing with a tool or whatever it is, cool ideas of how to solve the problem or solve different problems. It's about adding value. Uh, creating a certain level of not just not just retaining them, but creating a certain level of loyalty and to get to the point where they're happy to refer you to other people. If somebody, if somebody came to them and said, oh, who should I use for this problem? They'll go, I'm happy with this. They have a great experience with them. Choose them. Right. So yeah. I would say that's really what content is there for. Yeah, I, I love that. And I would add, add one thing that I think we often forget. Everyone forgets that. And it is that it's not only that we need to convert uh, like potential customers to customers. There's also the content that we need to produce, which will help our existing customers or people that are just following us to convert potential customers for us. Right. And I think that is something that we often forget. And that is, uh, you know, a part of the whole strategy that we rarely think about. Yeah, uh, that's actually a very good point. Um, I think I see it even in in the way that I do things where somebody needed a solution for something and I haven't used that solution before, but I have a, and this goes back to experiences, uh, positive experiences. I have a positive experience with uh, two or three people at a company that does, that solves that really well. And I trust them because of those positive experiences. So even though I haven't used them before, I will, I would refer them just because I, of those experiences. Yeah, and that's and I, they've essentially got me to evangelize for them without even selling me anything. Yeah, let, let's get a little bit into into that topic because it's kind of interesting. And I was uh, thinking of getting somebody from ClickUp to join me to talk more about the topic because uh, uh, you know I like to be honest. So they they approached me to to be c- kind of to post a few posts per month for them. I still didn't do it, but. I would do it even without them paying me because it's a good tool. I yeah. like it. And, and you know, I, I think that's the whole point of those things. Like we are all marketers using, diff- using different tools. And if uh, the company can, can see us as somebody who is using their tool and likes it and do, would do it even for free, why wouldn't they pay us to, you know, to help them attract more people to something that is already working for us and getting results? It's like influencer marketing. Exactly, just in in a B two B, and I think it's already there. Not many people are talking about it, but I think it's yeah. already arrived. There's um, there's a guy. Um, what's his name? Uh, Yol, Yol, I think Yoli Israeli or something. Like, uh, so he owns a he owns an agency called Whitey Digital. He started this uh, cybersecurity influencers kind of network. Um, it's kind of the same concept. It. Uh, influencers are growing within uh, B2B. And I think that's a direct relationship uh, that is directly impacted by social. The, the rise of social um, in the B2B world has really impacted the, the the state of influencers and the effectiveness of influencers in selling products. Now, I hope we don't get to the stage where you have like these fake promotions of like, oh, I recommend X and they sponsor me and like that. Uh, it go to that stage. And I think then it would lose its trust a lot more, but they are becoming more and more of an effective tool. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I mentioned from time to time, like uh, Jasper, 
for example. I'm using it sometimes to help me get uh, inspired or like solve some puzzles out, uh, but I'm not paid by them. But they have a great affiliate program that if I put the link here or there, uh, without even making an effort, basically it got me to the moment when I don't pay anything for Jasper to use it, right? Okay. And it's not a small thing to have. Uh, no. And there are more and more these kind of these kind of tools, and I don't see it talked about that much, especially in the higher circles. You know, because like affiliate or influencer marketing in B two B, those kind of things, they are being talked about on some affiliate marketing conferences or some conferences where there's a lot of great things. You know, things that are in a gray niche that are maybe good, maybe no. But I think these things are really good and can be used really well if we uh, just position them in the right conversations and use them the right way. Right. Well, you have um, you have for like Evan, you've had a lot of companies that have like referral partners. So they'll use marketing agencies, the company as referral partners, like HubSpot does that, Salesforce does that. A lot of these companies do it. Mm -hmm. You really have with the rise of personal brands. Uh, this has become an option and i have i'm i i've not used influencer marketing i've considered it i want to use it to see how it works um i would like to see um if anybody has like to see like how people have succeeded with it because it's like you said it's not really talked about that much but um it's influencer marketing and, and affiliate marketing first of all it's often seen as like an e-commerce b2c kind of tactic it also, it's also a little bit, I think part of the hesitance to use it, it, depending on the model you have, it means giving money to somebody else. And if you have a recurring revenue model uh, to give, uh, it, it becomes a lot more complicated to do influencer marketing or affiliate marketing in that way, because it means giving a percentage, a recurring percentage away, especially if you're not making, if you're not meeting your, breaking even on your customer acquisition cost within like, let's say nine months, you're just increasing the, the cost that you would have and the time that it, either you would have to, depending on the, the, the program that you have, you would either be increasing your price or you would have take longer time to, to get, uh, to get actually to break even. I don't suppose it would be a, a whole amount, but even if they take like two, 2% of everything they've done, it's still depending on the contract could be sizable. So I would say there's a point of hesitation there. Also, I would say it's a point of control is that mm -hmm. we like to control our marketing. We like to control the message. We like to own it uh, as much as possible. And you don't really control affiliate and influencer marketing. Somebody else is controlling it. There's a big risk there as well. And that is if they do something wrong, you get negatively affected by it. And you see it happen in the e-commerce world so much that brands end up disassociating with um, even with like celebrities or other influencers because of the fact that they're people and they can sometimes do bad stuff or go a little crazy. So there is that risk. And yeah, I think the uh, final reason, I think the final reason is just that there's st essentially there's a, a finite amount of things that they want to do and uh, they keep to a formula and they just don't consider it. I mean, yeah. I think I haven't considered it really strongly for a long time. And it's just because there's so much other things to do. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, uh, um, I started the conversation about it because I see a few companies, including ClickUp, not paid to say this, but <laughs> <laughs> I got to say it, but, uh, you know, because they there's no links. There's no like I'm gonna follow who's coming from your, uh, you know, from your profile. Who's getting over there? They just consider me or anybody else that has a community, has a great point of view about the things, and can use that influence to kind of share a few things, use a few examples to talk about their product. That's it. Like they don't expect. Uh, me to you know to show in the data how much uh, I have contributed to the to the revenue or something else you know 
And I think if you look at from that example, it's just like pure influence, nothing else. They consider you a thought leader and they want you to be one of the people that is talking about their brand and their product. And if that stands up, uh, if that uh, remains in that way, I think it can move a mountains in a, in a long period of time. Yeah. It's a, it's a brand association play rather than exactly, a, exactly. It's, a, it's sort of like a long-term play by extending their association, getting reaching, um, essentially getting their, uh, extending their reach um, in a much more natural, semi-natural way um, by using people who have influence rather than kind of saying like, no, you have to get me deals into much more short term, a much more short term play. Uh, agree, agree. Um, I would, I would really like to see how it turns out for them. Yeah, I think it's lasting for some time now. I'm seeing more and more people because they are doing the outreach towards the people they consider ideal. Uh, you know, let's call them influencers. Uh, and so far, I see it's you know probably going well since they keep on doing it. And I'll investigate it <laughs> and share it with the world. So. Uh, let's let's check it out. But there's one top, one uh, more topic that we uh, thought of, uh, of chatting about, and let's do a short overview of how do you see advertising today? Because I think it's changed uh, not just a little bit, by a lo- I think it's changed a lot from what it was for the B two B companies to where it's becoming now. To to um, change what? Sorry, advertising. The way oh, it is now, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a, there is a big change. Um, I, I really sincerely hope that a lot of companies appreciate the change that's happened. I don't think it's a change between you know Google's going down or the CPMs are going yeah. up or uh, that's not. There are certain there's certain like I think technical things that have changed. Obviously, um, some affect the B two B market more. Some affect the B the e commerce market uh, market a lot more um in all the on across the different platforms um i think the biggest thing that has changed in advertising is just well advertising digital advertising its biggest blessing that really why people did it is just not just a level of control it just allowed companies smaller companies to really get their their brand out there or to actually drive business because if you went before digital advertising, if you were a small business, either you would have to pay a fortune or you'd be limited to your basically your locale, to the walk-in traffic. And you, if, you were, if you're a small business, you would have to maybe early days, Facebook or whatever it is. It would be really hard to grow a small company. What digital advertising really did um, is that it allowed companies of any shape to actually put in a fight and compete. Right? You have to be, but what it's made is that you have to, if you don't have a budget, if you don't have a high enough budget, you have to be craftier about what you do, but you can still fight. Um, what has changed is essentially those bottom of the funnel keywords that everybody was going after. They've become expensive to the point where if that's all you're doing, you are going to be spending, even if you win deals, right, with that, you are still going to be spending way more than you have to and way more than you're worth, than it's worth actually doing. The other thing that it's done is it's brought in an era of micro testing, mm-hmm. right, for micro results as well. Because if you change something here, uh, you change something there, like a, a word here, a word there, it doesn't really, Im- it, it won't really strategically impact you. But what you can use it for, if you really want to use it properly, is you can change your entire message, test different ads with completely different messages and see how that works. Um, one of the things that I've seen change uh, is because of that focus and everybody's competing on the bo- bottom of the funnel is that there's the opportunity is for people that want to look at paid media as also as a content distribution channel. Because, yeah. because if you're going after whatever platform you're going under after is that 
essentially you're creating that impact before you're actually before you are actually going um you're going for that high intent and not only that you have far more chance of getting that high intent conversion and much cheaper because you had that impact or even then coming organically to you because they've had um impact and I would say I spend probably about 60 to 70 of my budget trying to figure out, trying to, I, and I'm still trying to figure this out a lot, is just finding the best ways to bring meaningful um, engagement to the website, to, um, distributing content through paid media as much as possible. And then I go and those people that have actually meaningfully engaged, and when I say meaningfully engaged, I actually have a conversion that's, that's based around scroll depth and time. So I'm actually measuring to the best of my ability, have they actually even skimmed that the content piece or watched that video? And that's what I would consider a conversion for those. And for those people, I would it's a lot easier to actually increase. And I've seen the results go from I think the company that now we had very, we had basically no high intent leads coming from paid media. And now, and I think in the last month or two, we've started getting at least, um, I would say around um, maybe 10, 15 a week and about 25 to 30% of them convert into pipeline. So, and that's all through sort of going through content first. So I kind of see that's where, that's where paid media has more of its role. And again, it's not about brand awareness, it's about creating that impact. Yeah, I, I, to I totally agree. And it's not only like consuming on the website, it's also consuming in the feed. Now you have a chance to give people a chance to consume the content in the feed and then right. you measure, measure the impressions. Because if you go after the small target group, narrow group of, uh, you know, of accounts that you want to target specific people in specific positions and you, know, you can confirm that they are consuming the content, you know, then... The same thing happens as uh, the thing that you saw happening on the website because that's another proof that they are consuming content. And then you just need to wait. If there is the right content, the right people, you just need to wait for decision-making to happen. Huh. We can call it dark funnel, but something yeah. that's happening inside the company, how they, the conversations are going, they can go from below to up or they can go to the top down. But uh, it doesn't matter. Somebody will come and convert it can be the people, the decision maker. It can be somebody who will, for example, use the tool that went from bottom, had a conversation and like CFO is coming to, to pay. You know, you don't know how it's going. There are a lot of possibilities, but what you can know and what you can do is you can make sure that the right people are consuming and really engaging with your content. Right. Content is made to be engaged and any channel that you use, the best channels that you can use to make sure that it happens, you should do it. There's no reason why not to. And I think the, I mean, this is going back to a little bit the uh, previous uh, topic on content and its role, but if you move to, if you move away from this kind of desperate, I need to get this sort of desperation of, I need to build pipeline as fast as possible, um, which kind of goes, which kind of uh, forces you to go into a lot of short term short-term tactics that aren't really scalable um, and don't last over, like they maybe work for six months, 10 months, whatever, or, but usually not longer than that. But once you start shifting the mindset that content is made to be engaged, you also change the way that you, that you approach even advertising your content, because let's say you have, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not opposed to gated content. I'm really not. I think there's a time and place for it. And if you're producing good quality content, then having a gated piece could could actually positively impact so long as you don't ask for too much and it actually gives a lot of value. But let's say you do have a gated piece of content, right? Um, and you want to send it to somebody. If you're focused, but there's two ways of looking at it. If you're looking at that gated per content as a lead generator, even if you're not like abusing it, if you're not abusing the system, you're saying, this is a lead generator who's in my system uh, I'm still going to wait till they show signs of, 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 you know, explicit intent before I approach them or high or essentially high implicit intent before I approach them. That's fine. Um, but I do want to get the, if, if I do want to get the, the lead gen from them, if I, if my focus is that, uh, if my focus is 
that sort of level of engagement that I, if I'm looking at it as a potential content, uh, if I'm looking at as, um, you know, that this has to convert into something now or it's worthless, then the tactics that I choose uh, and dramatically and drastically change from if I say, no, I just want people to read and like and this piece of content and that it should be meaningful to them, then it's a completely different way of, um, of even promoting that piece of content. And paid actually really does have a way of accelerating this and testing out different ways. I'll give you an example. I've been running this experiment recently where um, I took two pieces of con blog content and I've been putting them on paid, uh, paid media, accelerating them quite a bit. And, and I chose two different types of messaging. One is a descriptor of the content, right, and kind of read more. And the other one is just something funny. Um, we have uh, one ad that, so one of the things that, so is about integrations. Right? One of the content pieces about integrations and messy integrations. And all I did in this ad is I did, you know that song, the fire bones connected to the... Yeah. No, yeah. You know that song? So I took that concept in the copy. I put the music emojis and I took that concept and I just did that and I just took apply that concept. And then at the end, I just said, what, what, this is supposed to, this is supposed to connect to that. It was, it was, I, it was just, it was just something like, humorous or fun. It was a very different way because my goal there is attention. My goal there is to get engagement. You can't get engagement if you don't get somebody's attention. And so your whole way of describing what you're doing on whether it's organic or paid becomes like radically different and you change your, your entire tone and then you get better results. And the results are these, the click through rates, the time, the actual the engagement on our site, the return visitors have gone up dramatically. Even our, our click through, our, even our CPC in, in, on this, it, um, and this is getting too tactical, but it, it actually, it, it actually is lower than what we were getting on Google because we were doing this and it was effective and it's been effective. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Uh, yeah, I think we uh, we nailed it because I think that's the biggest change that happened in advertising. You know, the distribution part and the way that you can use it to kind of create a relationship with people, give them just enough in each stage. So you can go not just look at it as a transactional way uh, or as, as we call it these days, digital sales, yeah. right? It's just a small part of it that needs to be there, but the other part, which is creating demand or... Uh, then the demand will just grow. And as you have this part, like more and more people will convert on these channels that are closing the demand. If you do the creation of demand or damning the demand the right way. Right. Uh, I mean, so I, uh -huh. yeah, I, I see, I see like there's a camp out there that like kind of, you know, demonizes paid advertising. And I, I think they're wrong. A hundred percent. Advertising is a tool and it's a really good tool to accelerate your demand, accelerate your brand, accelerate um, the consumption of your content and increase your reach uh, far more than, a, and it's not just even about, uh, some of it's about speed. Sometimes it's about getting, even just increasing your reach, um, just increasing your reach um, and, and in a much more in a targeted way. You can't control a lot of that with organic. It is a tool. It's a great tool if you use it properly and don't abuse it. You use it properly and don't abuse it. Love that. Uh, so one thing that we didn't talk about and that is top of my, your mind that you think can be great to leave after this conversation to everybody that's listening. Um, I would say uh, two things. Right? I would say, first of all, always ask why. Like, not like, you know, children, like, why, 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 why? I kind of question the reason why you're doing something and whether or not that will have, the, whether or not that thing will get you to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. And if, 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 if it doesn't have a purpose, or if it's done for its own sake, then it's a waste of time. But if it does towards bringing towards the strategy, the strategy to, to get to that end, to get to accomplish the vision, 
then that's what needs to be done. Nothing, things that don't accomplish that vision or don't fulfill that strategy are not worth pursuing. Everything has to be measured against that, which is why the executive team should always make their strategy um, as uh, like basically convey that strategy to as many people in the company, especially everybody in their team as much as possible so that everybody can have that North Star and understand how it fits to the big picture. Love it. Basically, it eliminates one off things that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, tactics don't matter. It's all about are you get are you fulfilling the vision? Uh, are you moving towards that vision? Are you moving towards completing uh, to achieving what the strategy is hoping to achieve? And that's all that essentially that's that all that that's all that matters at the end of the day from a business perspective. Yeah, all that matters, guys. We talked about buyer's journey, the way it changed. We talked about the role of the content in it. We talked about messaging and how it, um, you know, helps you get people from one stage to another. And we covered also uh, a little bit of the B2B influencing uh, that is uh, starting to be a topic and also the way advertising has changed and leads to content distribution. So I would like to invite you now to go to the beginning of the episode and listen to everything again, go through each segment because uh, we, we talked about all, uh, all the different things and there are a lot of small nuggets that you can take away. Uh, yes, my man, thank you for, for being here. Thank you for being open and sharing. No, thanks uh, for having me, man. Where can people uh, actually follow you, find more information about what you do and all those other stuff? Um, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn and I'm always responsive. I'm, I'll DM me. Can't, uh, I'm going to respond to it. Um, I like connecting with people. I like chatting with people. So you can find me there. Yeah, guys. Make sure that you uh, that you say that you heard he is here on the Funky Marketing Show. Make sure to subscribe. Uh, if you're listening this on the audio platforms, then on your favorite audio platforms. If you're listening on YouTube, then subscribe to our YouTube channel and recommend it to, to other people who can do it uh, as well. And for the end, as we always say, uh, don't forget to keep it funky. Bye-bye, guys.